Hey everyone, it's Jamie Hope with Sign Sealed Delivered, and I have back with me today Sean Paul Murphy. And I think you were the last person I interviewed before we went on our little COVID break. It seemed like COVID hit and then life hit after that. And I think this is the first show I've done since then. And I can't think of a more fitting person to have on because it's winter and it's a good time to read. How are you? Pretty good. Um if I was the last one, people should see a huge difference in me. I haven't had my hair cut in almost a year. And, you know, you know how some people have been putting on their COVID-5 or 10. I put on my COVID-50, 75. So. I did not honestly notice that, but I did notice the hair. I definitely noticed the hair. But it works for you. You just look like a writer. It just, send, it just sends that writer vibe. <laughs> I, I will say that my wife did my hair. This is how she likes my hair to look. Ah, well, as long as the wife is happy, I always tell my husband that when he tries to do a goatee or something, I'm like, no, the beard. And then he's like, why? And I'm like, I'm the one that has to look at you. Like, I like the beard. (laughs) So we're here today because we're talking about something I'm super excited about. Um, I was one of your readers before Chapel Street was published. So I got to have a first crack at it first. And I have my official copy now. And I was super excited, by the way, to find out that I was acknowledged in it. I was so geeked. I was like, oh, my gosh, Jody, look, he mentioned me in his book. (laughs) So um, it was and I had no problem reading it twice. This book is something I think everybody will enjoy. And for those who are um, faith based people who who are like, oh, I couldn't read that. That's a horror book. It is, but it's in the vein of he, Sean Paul Murphy, actually talks about faith or lack thereof. And then you follow the main character, you'll see um, how he goes from a pretty steady unbeliever to because of what he's seeing, um, you know, he starts to question, well, maybe there is something going on. And then, you know, you get to see him evolve from there. So it is, it has horror in it, but it also has uh, a faith element to it, too. So that's what really engage me in this. So before we get into it, I just want to give everybody a little quick um, background on you. You've written, what, 14 or over 14 movies. And one one thing I didn't know that I, I don't know why I never knew this, but you wrote some short films for the FBI that won six Emmys. Is that right? Yes. Um, the films won the Emmys in various categories, but I did not win an Emmy for the writing. So I cannot say I'm an Emmy winner. Oh, I that's say that my that's, films have won a combined six Emmys. I can't say that. Hey, that I don't care. You were part of that team. That's not cool. You should have won. I mean, I know what a great writer you are. I mean, you won the Kairos Prize for people who don't know that has a fifty thousand dollar award that goes along with it. I mean, you have done a lot, and um, we'll get to it in a little bit. But I'm hoping that we will see a movie out of this book. So, so am I. That would be great. And we'll have to discuss that in a little bit. Maybe you can give us a little sneak peek into any updates there. But I wanted to start with um, what possessed you, no pun intended, what possessed you to write this book? Tell the people a little bit about how you got the idea. Well, the backstory um, is that uh, my family moved into a house in 1974 in northeast Baltimore, not realizing that it was very actively haunted. And in the, um, as bad as it was haunted, it did, nothing bothered me in the house until the mid eighties, there was an incident in the house. And after that, I would say, um, through the late eighties, it was like very actively haunted. It was like poltergeist or the exorcist. It was so really did, it, did it, but did it bother anybody else? I know you had kind of a larger family. Did, did it bother anyone else before that? Or did it start yes. being... It bothered my my mother was aware of it. My my one sister killed herself. I, we never just, and I never really discussed it in detail to her it was there prior to her death. But it definitely bothered my sister. It essentially seemed to bother everyone except my older brother who didn't live at the house that long before he went off on his own and um, or moved out. And it and my father who it didn't seem to bother until late in his life, but he was active. And also, and say that I'm sorry. Say that again. You cut out a little bit. Okay. Well, my it started bothering my father late in his life, and I did a series of interviews with family members. I'm 
basically why this book was written and why I'm doing a blog about the actual haunting is my mother asked me a couple years ago whether I thought the entity in the house was responsible in part for the deaths of my siblings, my two siblings, my younger sister Laurie and my younger brother Mark, who both killed themselves, one in 1994, one in 1999. And that's that's something I'd been considering for a long time myself. And um, the book was a fictional way to deal with the, you know, with the amount of emotion and all. So I Mm -hmm. wrote the book. And if you read my blogs, you'll see that there's a lot in the blogs. The, the book is really based on a lot of reality, but extremely exaggerated. And the, one of the first people I gave my book, to read my book was my younger sister, Jeannie. And um, she read it, and she recognized it that pretty much everything in there, except the ending and all, which is a lot of stuff is very exaggerated. But she, she said it was a cartoon version of what happened to us that it was exaggerated, but there was a lot grounded in truth. And at that point, my family never discussed the haunting because we felt talking about it empowered it. And if you weren't in the house and if you talked about it, it could come to you, which is I've learned subsequently is a sign that it could be a demonic entity. You know, well, demonic, demonic entities can move. They will move. Yeah, poltergeist tend. I've seen several um, occurrences of that. There was a movie, Gal, it was over 20 years ago, but it scared the tar out of me because that's what it was. This family moved around from house to house and it followed you. But once you started talking about it, did you have any occurrences after that? Or I would say that we've had some occurrences after that. Really? Yeah, we, we after had, you started you know, talking about it? Yeah, at least we, at least we did here. So, <gasps> really? Things. Oh, wow. That's a new development. I don't think I was aware of that. Oh, my goodness. Wow. I can't imagine. But, you know, I mean, it's still good that you did it because regardless, you're showing that you're not afraid. I mean, you know, when you're acting out of fear and you're not talking about it, you're you're acting out of fear. And when you talk about it and show that your faith, you know, is stronger than them, then, you know, I think that that says a lot, too. But I mean, the book is just it's chilling and it's it's riveting. And for anybody who is looking for a book to pick up, Chapel Street is it because it's easy reading um, it draws you in right away. You just have such a way of, of drawing us in and relating to the characters. So why don't you tell us a little bit about um, about your character, Rick, and, and uh, you know, what, what happens to him here? <laughs> well, Rick is me. <laughs> <laughs> we write I, what we know. <laughs> I'm writing Rick because it, I like to say Rick is more of a loser than me, but not much more. <laughs> You're not a loser. Oh, my gosh. If you're a loser, then I'm a pathetic loser. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, Rick is a very inward. Rick, strangely, much like me, lived in a family that was really racked by suicide. And it affects every pretty much every aspect of his life. And he turns to genealogy to try to figure it out. He's unmarried. He's had. Um, he was involved in a long relationship, but ultimately didn't marry her. Mainly because of like nightmares he had that she would wait that she would, you know that she is what that she would eventually die. You know that he mm-hmm. would wake up one day and she would be dead, and mm-hmm. he didn't face that possibility, which is true of every marriage. You know, sure. Hemingway said every uh, every love story ends in tragedy. It's true story. I mean, except for those rare few who die together. You know, I mean, you hear about those who die minutes apart. So I mean, other than that, yeah, it's definitely true in most cases. Well, I tell you what, if you, ever, if you ever drove anywhere with me, you'd see that there's a good possibility Debbie and I will die together, you know, because of the way I drive. But that's another story. So I'm Rick sorry, is, could you, you, you cut, I'm sorry, you cut out again. What did you say? I don't know if that's my internet. Let me make sure that my family's off of it. But go ahead and repeat that. What did you just say about that? I said, if you ever drove anywhere with me, you would see that there's an excellent chance that Debbie and I will die together. Because <laughs> of the <way> <laughs> I don't, okay, mental note, if I ever come to visit you, I will drive. <laughs> yeah. It's funny, when I got to Italy, and they wouldn't let me drive in a car on their roads. <laughs> they saw how Well, I are they, do they drive on the wrong side? Are we the only ones that drive on the right side of the road? <laughs> uh, they drive on the same side as we do. But I did drive through, I did drive through Ireland on the other one. Really? I stayed on the right, the, the, the uh, proper side of the road there. 
That's always been my fear. I've always, that's always been my fear of going to a different country, having to drive. I mean, I just can't imagine how confusing that is. <laughs> Rome was the, one of the few places my wife appreciated my driving because in Rome, the traffic is so crazy that, you know, you have to be utterly fearless. There's, there's traffic circles and everything. You have to be utterly fearless to survive driving. That's a good, a good, good to know. Good to know. So, so, Rick, so Rick, his main hobby is the same hobby I have. I, I, um, I memorialize, I go to graveyards all the time, photograph tombstones and put them up on a website called Find a Grave, which is a big genealogical site. It's very helpful. And I put all my family up there. And then I just started doing strangers. I put biographical information about them. And that's what Rick does. And in the course, in the course of um, early in the book, he photographs the wrong grave. And he didn't realize the mechanisms which drew him to this grave of this woman, Betty Costick. And he has no idea who she is at first, but then realizes that um, his family had a, a connection with her family that goes back almost 100 years. And that uh, this was, you know, his whole life was set for this moment. You know, that um, she was a fortune teller that his mother used to go to. And, his, her, and Betty essentially destroyed... Um, his mother as well, his father, his brother, and now it's his turn to die. And another person is brought in there too, um, a woman who he knows as Tombstone Terry, who also who also works for um, find, you know memorializing people on find find a grave. I call it restingplace.com in the book, mm -hmm. which was going to be the original cop, um, mm -hmm. title of the book. But uh, so what he. They meet, and what he doesn't realize is that their families were, that his family with her, um, Terry Poscasil, was also tracked back 100 years as well. Their families were very close, and they knew this Betty's family, and they're paying for ancient sins. You know, the sins wow. of the fathers being, you know, um, brought mm -hmm. upon the children. And that and that was I loved I love that story element. Obviously, you you bring this woman in there, and you, you, I couldn't help but think there's some incidents in the book, and I don't want to ruin it for people, but I'll just say that there are times when people in your story are accused of having a mental illness because they are dealing with this entity, and I couldn't help but thinking, you know. Is there occurrences in real life where, you know, because Pete, we've heard of, you know, legit cases of possession. I mean, look at the exorcist, you know, and we've seen, you know, I mean, there was that case in Indiana a few years ago where that woman, her and her two, I believe they were young sons, um, their house became so possessed that it started possessing her kids. And they have records of sheriff. They have like health professionals. They have law enforcement. They were in a room with this kid and the kid started walking up the wall. I mean, this is documented. This was mainstream news. And so you see these occurrences. So you see that this is a possibility. And, you know, of course, it, you've got to be careful with how you say that. But it does make one wonder, are people sometimes do they have some form of a demonic bothering or oppression that, you know, that could cause them to have some of these issues that might mimic a mental illness. I'm sure it's few and far between, but does it happen? I mean, could that happen? Well, let me tell you how, how I deal with that in the book. Now, my brother Mark, who uh, committed suicide in Michigan, your very state, wow. Flint, um, he, um, he was definitely suffering from mental illness for most of his time since his 20s onward. And um, it was a very sad case. And, and his death was... You know, it was predictable, let us say, you know, mm -hmm. of what he was going through. And um, one of the, and that, and that's one of the issues I was exploring is in the book and also in the blogs is whether um, mental, whether their mental illness could have been influenced by what went on in the house. Now, I think, and if you read my book, the character Lenny, you know, mm -hmm. who is the dead brother, um, the character Rick, once this begins, starts receiving visits from his um, his brother Lenny, who killed himself. Le I dedicated the book, if I'm not mistaken, to my brother Mark. And Lenny is very much like my brother Mark. Oh, is he really? Yeah. Well, I liked Lenny, so I'm sure your brother was very well liked too. I loved his character. So my brother Mark was much more much was crazy and much more popular than I. 
<laughs> I think he had, for every friend I have, I think he had eight. And, wow. You know, but Lenny, um, the dynamic is slightly different. That my brother Mark was my younger brother, and in the book, Lenny is the old is the dead older brother. So, but the character, anyone who knew Mark will definitely see Mark in in Lenny. And when Lenny talks a lot about the mental illness he went through, because he's one of the people who's telling Rick that Rick, you know. You're crazy, but he's also telling him that you're not really crazy. You're, mm-hmm. you're crazy, but it's Betty that's making you, you know, right. uh, that she's, yes. she's behind the mental illness. Mm-hmm. Yes. A lot of Lenny's discussions, my brother and I were sometimes, you know, some sometimes estranged and sometimes close, depending on the, his mental state of mind. But a lot of what Lenny says about mental illness is things that my brother, Lenny describes what he went through in mental illness are things my brother Mark told me, you know, so I was drawing very much on his mental illness and the things he said, how difficult it was for him to live, what it felt like, you know, going into being, you know, uh, put, you know, involuntarily, um, not incarcerated, what would you say, involuntarily committed, mm-hmm. and what it's like coming out, you know, drugged up and everything, you know, so I, you know, I draw on that. And I also draw on, you know, my own experiences and the other experiences of people in my family. You know, we would also often, once Mark was crazy, we would kind of have to hunt him down, you know, capture him. You know, wow. And seem to go to the hospital or like, you know, restrain him and take him mm-hmm. to the hospital. You know, so, and so we knew the hospital procedures. We knew how long he'd be in, you know, how it worked and. You know, some of the hospitals are based on real hospitals where he went. I'm sure the um, hospitals wouldn't necessarily like the way I describe it. Yeah, I mean, but the truth, the truth, you know, I mean, it's if it's the truth, then say ouch. Yeah, and I will say one thing. I think a lot of, you know, you see this in Christian circles that acquaint. A lot of Christians don't believe in mental illness. You know, a lot of. What? They don't. They believe that anything that you would call mental illness is demon demon possession oh that's absurd it is absurd and i don't want to find myself on that category of people Mm -hmm. you know if your doctor tells you you know to um you know take take your medicine please take your medicine but you do hear this and i've seen this and the first real example i met of mental illness was a woman i'm not gonna you know not gonna mention her name but i went to a bible study with her and she was in and out of institutions all the time, in and out of halfway houses. And she was one of these people that breaks your heart because when, you know, it's like we're hearing that her family would have nothing to do with her. And we're like, oh, what cruel people her family must be. Mm-hmm. But they had been dealing with this for 20 years. Sure. Really right. Three months until she absolutely burns you out. But, sure. Uh, because everything you do to help her and you get her set up somewhere, she'd throw it all away. Oh. But what's really chilling is this was like a charismatic prayer group we were in, Bible studies, and then the prayer group. Mm-hmm. And when people would um, start speaking in tongues and all, who I probably people turning off the uh, podcast. <laughs> um, she would go on to these like demonic rants and say things like, you know, talk about Satan and praising Satan. While really? Other You're kidding me. No. You know, so that was that was kind of chilling. So I would say, you know, in her case, it is possibly something. And maybe it maybe it's a mix. You know, I mean, maybe I mean, you never know. I mean, it could be. I mean, I've I have had um, I have a family member too that another family member had to deal with. So I'm very familiar, and I was up close and personal with that issue. Um, it was a grandparent that struggled with that after one of the other, their, their spouse died. So I'm definitely familiar with that. And, um, you know, it was, it's, it's heartbreaking to watch. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's crazy. I can't believe that people would just say, I mean, are there maybe occurrences? Sure. You know, the Catholic church, they, they have documented cases of this. There's people that would tell you that they, that they felt that way. But I mean, it, why wouldn't there's certain people, Christians that believe that it's just all like 
spiritually motivated. I mean, some people are born, you know, without a leg or they're born without an arm or, you know, they're, they have other deformities or there's other special needs issues. So why can't there be a mental illness? Why can't there be a chemical, you know, like why, why would they, why would they shun that when, you know, there are other people that have other issues? Well, I think if you were to look on Google, you'll see that some major ministries you would have heard of have gotten in trouble for saying this sort of thing, been sued and all. So um, there, I'm not going to name any of them. Sure. But, you know, it's, <laughs> it's very it's very dangerous. Um, it is. And if you if you're actively involved in a church, you know, particularly in a populated area, you are going to have people coming in who are in need of me- in mental issues. And, sure. Uh, Sure. And, you know, you got to you got to meet them where they are. But you, you know, the mm-hmm. Lord can heal, but sometimes he, he heals us by. Bringing right. Us doctors. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, when now you said that you said that you're it was you, you were asked if you thought that this entity had anything to do with your brother and sister's suicide and. Um, like, what do you, what do your, your thoughts on that? Do you, you seem to think that it's, uh, maybe had a little bit of influence or no, or maybe one did and the other didn't. What are your thoughts? Well, COVID has stopped my, um, I'm doing it a series of blogs and the blogs essentially have three parts. The first part is dealing with the actual haunting itself, manifestations, what happened. And since my family didn't talk about it, this has all been very eye opening. The second part is I'm going to deal with the deaths of my siblings. And, you know, I'm starting to gather information about that now. Like, okay. Just things like the police reports, autopsy reports. Gotcha. Like that, physical mm-hmm. stuff. Mm-hmm. And the third part is going to be an evaluation. Uh, I'm going to give expert opinion on what happened to us, people who are involved in spiritual warfare, people involved in psychiatry, people who are involved in uh, secular um, paranormal investigators. Oh, wow. I'm, plan- I'm planning to, to look across the whole spectrum. What are my thoughts now? My thoughts now are, um, it's funny because if you talk to my family members who have been going on this journey with me, their opinions are very mixed. But I do know that, um, like in our house, if you read my blog, you'll know that the entity would uh, mimic people's voices. Yes. Um, it, you know, and it would, you know, if, if it spoke to you, it would spoke, speak in the voice of someone you knew. Mm-hmm. And that would be. It's and terrifying. because of these blogs, people have come to me, like about my brother, and saying, when your, my brother was living in the room, if you read my blogs, we call it the hell room. That was the most active of it. He used to say people were talking. He could hear his mother and grandmother talking about him, saying they weren't, how they were going to commit him and all, when, when it was definitely not happening. Now, wow. that situation of, um, of um, what do you call it, uh, mental illness, Mm-hmm. But considering other people in the house had similar things, the entity really seemed to like talking in my mother's voice. It talked to other people in my mother's voice a lot. And do you have a? Do you know why? Do you have any speculation as to why? You know, it's funny because my niece Natalie, the daughter of my sister who killed herself, eventually came to live at that house. And as she gave her interview, she said, "You know, it's funny because if it really wanted to freak, because she said it, you." It didn't have conversations with her. Her name is Natalie. It would say like, "Hi, Nat. How you doing, Nat? What's going on, Nat? What are you doing, Nat?" And it would it would do this in my and my mother's voice, her grandmother, while my grandmother, while my mother would be like away on the Eastern Shore and things like that. Wow. And she said, "You would think that if this thing would have really freaked me out, it would have spoken my mother's voice." You know her 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 dead mother's voice, mm. which you certainly have known since her dead mother had lived at that house. Sure. So you know that got me thinking, and we had some debates. And I think my mother, you know, it's like, well, why didn't it? if this thing was malevolent, why didn't it do the, the most damaging thing? I think it was my mother who came up with the, what she thought the solution was: is that it wanted to talk, mm. and it, if you if it talked in the voice of someone who was dead you would know that it wasn't the person. Uh, But it spoke in the voice of someone you knew, like it spoke in the voice of one of my brother's friends to my mother, things like that. Workmen at our house, it spoke in my mother's voice to them. You know, but if you spoke, if it spoke in the voice of someone you knew, you would know that it's not, that 
it, it could possibly be them, you could engage in conversation. Oh, wow. We wanted to be engaged. It definitely was aware of us, and it, it was cognizant of us. It was cognizant of what it was doing, and it wanted to, it wanted to be invited in more into our lives. It had an intelligence then. It... But that's something I've been quizzing everybody about, and everyone says, you know, it's funny. You know, everyone definitely says it was, you know, who had any dealings with it, that it was intelligent. That it wasn't just like, you know, like they say, like poltergeists are just a force. This was an, this was an intelligent entity of some sort. And, sure. Uh, and you know, so it did want it did want to talk, and it did want to make deals. It would make offers. Like it would make offers. Yes. If you were to, like it, um, it offered supernatural powers to my sister. What? And my and my one of my nieces. What kind you know, of supernatural powers? They offered them clairvoyant powers. You know, there seems to be some clairvoyance in the female line of my family. And it said, you like what you could do now? I can give you much more. And, you know. It, wow. You know, it and the funny thing is my, my sister, my surviving sister, didn't know that it had done the same thing to her daughter. That it had done oh. to her. Really? And in my case, you know, after I had through prayer gotten it kicked out of my bedroom and it didn't bother me anymore there was one point where you know you're sitting there thinking you're always thinking you're crazy in these circumstances and i was standing in the hallway my my room was the back attic bedroom the hell room was the front attic bedroom a little hallway that led to the stairs down to the lower floor i was standing in that hallway and i said i said this out loud i said there's nothing there's nothing in there because if it was in there it would turn the lights on because the lights were off in the room. And it turned the lights on. And that was very much an invitation. I didn't hear a voice. I didn't hear anything. Mm -hmm. But if you think that's cool, you know, try try something else. Well, you just, know? well, and for you, the, if I remember correct um, from our previous time that we talked about your this haunting, um, one of the ways that you're, the Rick is like you too is, at one point, Rick wakes up and he, I mean, it's more pronounced and, and it's worse in the book, clearly, but he wakes up and he's out on his balcony from, you know, having, he goes from a dream to just waking up randomly on his balcony. Did something similar happen to you, didn't it? Yeah, that's the central, that's the central thing of the book is that every night Rick wakes up on his balcony about to jump off. And that's what happened to me. That's when I knew it was real. Like when you hear st footsteps, you hear movement, you feel things in your bed. I mean, that, you know, there's a way to dismiss all of that. But there were a number of nights in a row, some either three to five, where I woke up. I, my, the back of our house was very high up. And uh, I would wake up banging my head on the window or knee on the window frame, crawling out of that window, that attic window. A number of nights in a row, and it was always at 3 a.m. And the fact, you know, there's no rational explanation. Always at 3 a.m. Always at 3 a.m. Well, that's the fourth watch. That's yeah. the 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 belief is that that's when the spirit world, the like the veil between the spirit realm and our realm is thinnest, according to the Bible and, you know, some other, um, you know, if you read some other text like that, for some reason that it's like three to six or something like that, or three to seven or two, uh, somewhere around there. But three is like, I can't tell you how many times I've read stories similar to yours or watched a show. And it's, oh, it always seems to be three o'clock. It's always three o'clock. That is so bizarre. Yeah. And that's, that's what really scared me. That's what led to a lot of prayer. And, you know, there was a curiosity about it and that's like, this is not something they could be curious about or play with. Mm -hmm. And I told myself that I would never write about it. I make no mention of this at all in my um, in my first book, um, The Promise or the Pros and Cons of Talking with God, which is my memoir. I, mean, I make no mention of it. And the funny thing is, is that not only did my sibling, two siblings commit suicide, and I call that me climbing out on the roof, had I succeeded in getting out that window, I would have died, and there was it would have looked like a suicide because there was no right. rational explanation for it. Mm -hmm. And my mother had 
and events that would be, I, I call them in the blog suicide events because they weren't suicide attempts, but had they, they were actions that had they gone to their fulfillment would have looked like suicide with my mother, my sister Jeannie, my brother John. And that's what makes me think more than anything else that, mm-hmm. you know, that there were, that there was some sort of um, demonic aspect to my sibling suicide because of the great amount of suicide. And did you read my first book, The Promise or the Pros and Cons of Talking with God? I did. You, yep. It's been a, it's been probably two or three, probably two or three years, but yes, I did. I was very, I mean, you're just such a good writer. I, every time I sit down to read one of your books, every, I'm like, stop, stop. Don't talk to me. I'm reading. <laughs> I got to well, finish this. So. <laughs> well, if you notice in the chapter, I talk about how I attempted suicide in like 1983 or 1983. Mm-hmm. And in the house, in the living room of the house, in the house. And, um, even as I was trying to recall the events that actually happened, I couldn't, I said I had a spiritual, mental, psychological, spiritual breakdown that was, in, looking back at me, with, was inexplicable. I mean, I was going through a tough time with my relationship, which would ultimately fall apart. It had fallen apart, but it was, at that moment, it was actually going well. But, oh, you know, yeah. I, I had this, uh, and I never equated that suicide event with anything that went on with my siblings or and I didn't know about these other events that happened you know um, mm-hmm. but now looking back I'm beginning to wonder whether I was just susceptible to what was going on when it went when I it ha- I couldn't figure out why it seemed it seemed extr- suicide seemed like a, a very extreme solution to what right. I was going for that seemed it seemed inexplicably extreme and so I, did it come out? Did it come out of nowhere? I mean, did you feel like once you removed yourself from the house, you you meant you had a, a better mental clarity? Or it was um, years later, but um, I mean, I was in the house for many years. I was in the house ten years after that, and I had the going out on the roof aspect. You know, am I more mentally clear here where I live now? Yes, definitely. You know, I would say mm-hmm. so. I've never that is, been. yeah. I mean, this whole thing. So tell me what um, what the process was like writing this book. Obviously, there's a large element of your life in there, which makes it even more intriguing. And I think that's what people really, um, I really hope people understand. Because anytime, I mean, you can relate to real life events in a story. For some reason, it just makes the story more compelling, more intriguing, and it makes you want to learn more. So um it must have been weird or like, tell me about that process and how long it took you to write this and um, how you came up with this. Is there a way that you came up with this story with this Betty? Obviously I know that you do the genealogy and I do too. I'm, I'm a, my family historian. I mean, I went, I, that's like, I'm, I can geek out on that all day. So everybody always comes to me like, you know, in fact, one of my, I found out one of my ancestors, (laughs) this is bad. He was a horse thief, which if anybody knows anything about history is probably one of the worst things you can be. And he actually, they actually sold horses to, I believe it was Jesse James. It was some well-known outlaw like that. So um, that was something that I found out that was kind of interesting. But, um, embrace so, but I do. Them all. Embrace them all. <laughs> right. But, you know, but so it's interesting to find that. But so how did you like, how did you come up with this Betty and in, in this whole situation? Did, did you have did you stumble upon something that made you think of it or just well, every book I've now I'd say when I write a screenplay, I generally enjoy the process. You know, I, it's usually a story. I Even if it's like a commission piece and I have to write it, there's, you know, uh, tension or suspense about getting it done in time Mm -hmm. you know because usually when i'm commissioned to write something there's always there's already a shooting day so Mm -hmm. um but i i would say i didn't enjoy writing either of my books they were both they were both pulling teeth the first one i was a very private person the first one was happened after you know i nearly died and i thought Mm -hmm. well i had this amazing story and amazing experience with god and i don't want that to be lost you know, I do want to tell it. And I really felt mm-hmm. compelled by God. And I tell you, I, I work in a faith-based writing thing. And 
everybody always tells me God told them to write everything, you know, and I'm like, <laughs> right. <laughs> and, but they always, it's like, God told me to write this screenplay. I'm like, okay, and they go, well, it's going to be, you know, it's their first screenplay, but it's going to be produced. Right, right. <laughs> and I'm like, did God tell you it was going to get made? Yeah, right. right. There's a big difference between writing it. If did yeah. God tell you to write I it? I wanted you to write it until you could learn the craft. Right. You know what I mean? So, um, but I, you know, I never felt. I, I knew I was being compelled because not only I did not want to write this book, and um, but God took away all my work. You know, I'm a oh. freelancer. He's sort of like he took away all my other work. I you're going to sit down and you're going to listen and you're going to do what I say. And if not, then I'm going to make you miserable until you do. <laughs> exactly. So that's the history of that book. So, you know, I really felt I was bleeding on the page. In this book, I was, um, it was the same way. The genesis of the book and writing the book came very quickly after my mother's question. You know, and I knew who Rick was going to be and I knew who Lenny was going to be. And I knew who Betty was going to be because Betty is based on the real person too. Oh, really? Yeah, I didn't based know that. on a real fortune teller named, strangely, Betty, that my mother went to, and my sister <gasps> who killed herself went to. My <gasps> sister who killed herself went to Betty a couple days before she killed herself. And she was Are not, you imagine, kidding me? No. And I finally found out, I didn't know who knew, but I, my one of my aunts who just died, and I was very, you know, I wanted to interview her, but she was very sick and I couldn't do it. I just wanted to interview her about her life, too. But she went with my sister up to um, Hagerstown, where Betty was operating. It's a town about, you know, I don't know, 70 miles from Baltimore. Mm -hmm. and, and so I thought only only my Aunt Debbie would know. But, you know, other people did know. And I, when I asked, I found out what it was. So my, my sister goes to Betty, and she'd gone to Betty before and said, um, what do you see in my future? And Betty said, I see nothing. <gasps> wow. Now, was this Betty? Was she, did you know much about her? Was she known for giving bad news too? Yeah, or? they called her bad news. Betty. They did call her bad news, Betty. So what, what would compel people to go to her if she, like, I mean, Accurate. that's, Huh? What's that? Accuracy? Who wants to know that? I mean, I do not want to know. Like, well, if I'm going to get hit by a bus tomorrow, like, don't tell me, you know? I mean, I don't... Know. What's that? Wouldn't you want to know? No! No! Do not tell me. God, do not tell me when I'm going to die. Nobody well, tell me when like I'm going to die. my first book. It was really about God was telling me what would happen tomorrow. And the thing that I learned about that after a number of years is it's better not to know. It really it's, is. But it really is. I mean, you know, I don't know. It just, I, that would, no, that would creep me out. It would mess with me too much. It's just like the only thing I'm worried about with dying is dying for a stupid reason. I tell everybody all the time, I, I'm not afraid of pain. And I hope I go out in an epic way because the last thing I want to hear is I slipped on a banana peel and like hit my head on some concrete or something. That would be such a, you know, I'd be mad if I went out that way. Yeah. <laughs> so. Here's the thing about that. You know, my, one thing my mother, and I, the mother is not based on my mother in the book. And as I was writing the book, I kept telling my mother I was writing this. And mm -hmm. every time I talk, talk, mentioned the book to her, I would, say, I would say, the mother is not based on you. So she was having the book on. Book's coming along great. The mother is not based on you. You know, my mother's kind of sensitive about it. Sure. On her. And <laughs> um, so I was constantly saying that. But the only thing she thought was unfair was how I treated Betty because she would talk to Betty. And Betty would say bad things, but um, she said she always presented it in a way as this is going to happen unless you change, you know. But she apparently didn't necessarily tell that to my sister. See, here's and here's here's my here's, my, my, yeah. here's my thing about that though. I mean, I do believe that people have that gift, and again, there's a lot of Christians that are like recoil at just saying that. But here's the thing: what's you know the difference between someone who is a prophet? who can see things and a person who, you know, maybe doesn't, um, I believe doesn't, uh, you know, that's not a prophet, but they have, you know, you would call them clairvoyant or psychic. I believe that people are tuned into different frequencies. So like there's God's frequency and then there's the other frequency. That's what I think could be going on. So 
when people say that these people, it's not real or that, you know, they dismiss it or whatever. I mean, that's what I believe. I believe it's originally a God given gift. So, um, obviously if you're not aware, sometimes you can get, you know, you can get lying spirits and you can get, you know, lying spirits to tell them things that are going to happen. So that's, that would be what the enemy's plan is for your life when they're telling you bad things. That's just something that I've kind of always thought. Of course, it's just a theory, so I'm not going to say it all is, you know, 100% fact, but. It's a very complicated subject, and um, there's a sure. lot of people believe different things. I mean, the American evangelical church comes down one way on it. And, right. But I don't think the American evangelical church is looking, it's a very rational church in the sense that, um, I'm not saying it downplays the supernatural, but I don't think it looks at the supernatural in the same way that the people who wrote the Bible look at the supernatural. I agree. Totally and, agree. You know, it's a very dangerous subject to discuss. Sure. The book I deal with it this way is that what they discover, much of their horror, is that Betty is, and this will be a factor in the sequel, the prequel, is that Betty is making these predictions. Because I don't know if the demonic can see the future. I'm sure, let's just say if you were an entity that had been watching human beings for thousands of years, mm-hmm. that if it sits and watches you for about a year or two, mm-hmm. it kind of know what you're going to do. It cannot right. predict it with accuracy. Well, and it can, and it can try and... It's seen thousands of other people. Just right. Very and, it can, and it can try and lead you down a certain path that it wants you to go. Well, that's, oh. that's where the book goes, as you know. What they discussed yes. is that Betty wasn't predicting the future, that the entity that was possessing her mm-hmm. was manufacturing the results it wanted. Yes. And so if it predicts you're going to die on January 2nd in a car accident, mm-hmm. it would make sure you, you know, it. Right, would, right. You know, yeah. so, you know, Betty wasn't predicting, Betty was murdering. Sure. Yes, exactly. So, that's what, and that's. Betty and, murdered my sister. In fact, she denied it. My other sister who had never seen Betty after my sister's death. My younger sister went out and when she sat down in front of Betty, the first thing Betty said to her was, I did not kill your sister. Wow. Wow. And it isn't like my sister drove out there to say, um, oh, by the way, she didn't even have the same last name. By the way, I I would like to talk to you about my sister who just killed herself. You may have known her. She used to come out and visit you. You know, it was nothing like that. So that sure, was sure. Betty's first word to my sister is, I did not kill your sister. Wow. I, I mean, I can imagine. And, <laughs> I mean, I can imagine in her mind, you know. I mean, I, I can't imagine how, you know, it's, that she must have felt when she heard that happened. I mean, I'm sure that that probably weighed on her, too. So, wow, that's, I never knew that. I did. So there's more to this book that's, that's, uh has some factual elements in it besides just the character you see in yourself and your family. I had no well, idea. I, I'm going, no one seems to know. It's funny because I'm published by Touchpoint Press. There's another Touchpoint author who lives in Pennsylvania, you know, about, you know, 40 miles from me. And we were chatting, you know, she was asking advice about Touchpoint. And I mentioned this, she read this book and she, she used to visit Betty too, by a strange coincidence, the actual same Betty that the character's based on. And she's what? like, well, I don't think, and she gave me some more insights, but no one knows Betty's last name. There might be one person I know who does, but I'm going to research Betty because I'm going to have to deal with her. I haven't done, I haven't brought Betty up in the blogs yet, but when I get to my, you know, I will be bringing Betty up later. So, that is phenomenal. I mean, that so, I just, yeah. wow. But here's, the, so once I started writing the book, the book came, the book was painful to write, but came very quickly. I per mm-hmm. se, I was working for National Geographic at the time, and that was kind of a, you know, a stupid job in the sense that, you know, I work for Discovery, and I think their state of the art, their, their um, systems, and their, you know, because I'm an editor, and their their video editing systems and how they handle the data, and how they export stuff is very smart and very quick. On, at National Geographic, oftentimes you would spend half, you, you know, I was working the night shift, you would spend half the night exporting some, exporting jobs. So you're just sitting there watching the process, the, the, um, yeah. the go across. <laughs> that does take some you know, time sometimes. Hours and hours at a time. Mm-hmm. So I was writing the book before I went to work, and sometimes if it, was, 
if I was just processing, you know, if I was just exporting, I would write it then. So I wrote it in the amount of time that I worked for National Geographic. But then, you know, I wasn't sure I wanted to publish the book. And I sat on the book for over a year. I maybe sent an, an email or two. I think I sent an email to like three agents possibly to look at it and maybe one horror publisher. And, you know, why but, is that? Why, why didn't you want to publish it? I, you know, it, in a sense, it's it, it. Although it's fiction, it's very much like my memoir in the sense that there's a lot. It's really personal to me. Sure. And I'm like, do I really want to put this out? Yeah, and, that's understandable. And also, too, and one of the factors is why I'm doing the blogs is that my my wife was worried that we were going to bring this thing back on us mm -hmm. by dealing with this. And the, my pastor was like, you know, sort of, you have an obligation to help people who are, you know, mm -hmm. or, you know, your knowledge. He was saying I should write a pamphlet about the actual event and how to handle it. I mean, still, pro you know, I've got hundreds of pages of based on, you know, based on the interviews. And, I agree with that. Halfway through it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I agree. Oh, yeah. I agree with that. That's a, that's I, I agree with what he said. That's that's uh. My, um, wife, right, and my wife wants to jump well, in. Jamie, and I, do, I do too. But the only thing is, we've got these beautiful grandchildren. Oh. And mm -hmm. we have to play the risk. They're beautiful kids. Yeah, but we got to sure. play the power of God. I know. That's yeah. what that was evident. I mean, I know. Yeah, but I have ch I have children, so I understand that. <laughs> it's not easy. Sure. You're risking um, involvement in something that we really don't understand, you know, right. like God does. Mm -hmm. So it's well, not it's now not that like I wanted to do it, you know. If, if sure. We had brothers, I would not. I would choose not to do it. But since, now, now that you've done it, how do you feel? Are you glad you did it, or do you regret it? Or too early to tell. Are you asking me? Yeah. <laughs> do you do you, do you how do you feel now that you guys have told this story and you're coming out with it? Do you feel like do you regret that it came out or do you feel okay with it so far? Do you think everything's okay or? Well, I know that God's in charge, mm -hmm. and uh, I I have to trust in Him, and this is what happened. I don't I. You know, when God gives you some mission, you say, you could say to him, no, I don't want to do that. But yeah. what do we have to do? We have to follow what God gives us to do. We can't get yep. out of it. You want to, right? Right. But a lot of people, missionaries, they're told to go to some godforsaken place. Mm -hmm. They get there, and it's hard, but we have to be soldiers, too. We're in his army. I mean, I could say, I want to do this, I don't want to do this, but if it sure. itself, you know, we have to do it. And it was true, um, you know, Satan comes for us all. He's always mm -hmm. been in the background, but what this book does, what Sean has exposed is bring it to the forefront. Yep, You know, Absolutely. in your face, so I've well, never I deal with something in your face all the time. Mm -hmm. And Saturday it came at me whilst I was praying Wow, really? So, yeah, and it, it came at me, and um, I said I had to tell it to get out. You know, I forcefully said, get out, and it had left. Sean mm -hmm. came upstairs running. He said, what's the matter? I said, well, it was here in the room. And uh, he was, well, I'll pray. I said, it's gone. I told it to get out. So, And then the next day, the sermon from the pastor was that we have to, you know, these things are real. These forces are real. We have to address them. So mm -hmm. he didn't call us to say, hey, I'm going to give this sermon. You know, he didn't know what was going on. Wow. So, no, you know, that's confirmation, right? It's confirmation. Yeah, it was very confirm confirming to me to stand by my husband and know that he's mm -hmm. doing something right. Well, my, I, I Would have family. Did we get this all on film? What's that? Did we get this all on tape? Oh, yeah, it's all on there. <laughs> But I have, I mean, I have a, I have a, a family member, um, who, whose house had, um, an entity in it. And one of the people in that house does not, did not believe in anything in the afterlife. So when they started talking about this thing was hovering over me, hissing when I was sleeping, like when this person who's a complete agnostic says that, you know, there's some yeah. visit and a couple times I stayed there. And the spare bedroom, the bed would shake. And I mean, 
I'm not moving. And that thing is shaking and like candlesticks would be found from the mantle all the way across the room. She like, she told it to leave and it left. It was like, yeah. they, they hadn't seen it since it's been years. I mean, she was, you know, she was just irritated as I'll get out. Like I'm sleeping, leave me alone. So, yeah. and obviously there's different and some entities are more powerful than others. Some it's easier to, you know, you can shoo them out and go and other ones want to obviously stick around like what you guys are dealing with And people who thinks that think this is crazy, then I don't know what to tell you, but go and watch some movies and documentaries on it because it's real. <laughs> yeah, well, I would say that. Um, I sorry, say. sorry to interrupt. You. No, it was good it's, seeing you. It's it's not easy. It's not easy. I'm sure it's not. It's, it's, it's not easy for you either. I'm it's, sure it's not. We, have, you, we really don't have a choice, you know. You guys are brave. You're brave though for being obedient. I'm shaking. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, with God, I'm strong. But with sure. me personally, no, I, I don't like. I, I like say that too. I'm well, I, I'm a big old chicken. Fun. It's not fun. It's not you know to me. Yeah. I, it's just. Um, yeah. Taxing and you can't you, you can't begin to decide you know what it's doing or what because it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make any sense. Well, and I'm sure there's like the mental game too because there could be something that happens in the house that would have happened. It's not the thing. But maybe something happens and now all of a sudden you're like, oh, my gosh, was that it? Or was it something, you know, then you have that whole mind game, I'm sure, going on, too. So then you have to try and, you know, decide when it's whatever this entity is and when it's not. That would be hard, too. I mean, you're kind of always probably feel like you're on eggshells. <clears throat> well, you know, you just have to have faith and trust in God. God mm -hmm. goes before us. And, he, you know, this really took me because I was praying. I was upstairs praying. And at that point, you know, you're in a spirit know that God loves you. I mean, I know that God loves me. And that thing was allowed to come to my room, to my bedroom, right. to me in a private area. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I uh, screamed, you know, I said, get out with authority, you know, and it left. Yeah. Yeah, I could feel it leaving. You know, it was like, Ooh. good. You know, and good. Uh, it was, uh, you know, but it's well, so part of our situation that we're going through because it, it really comes for the marriage. It that thing, it just is all invasive. I, it really it preys mm -hmm. on it preys on. Um, I would say that it its spirit is essentially isolating and depressing people. Yeah. You know, and uh, that's actually a normal occurrence. I've heard from people who have poltergeists. I have heard so many times, and people who moved into a haunted house. And then their marriage fell apart and then they leave the house because it was one that didn't follow. And all of a sudden, like everything changes, like it's instant relief. It's instantly better, you know, like and they didn't realize it at the time that that was what it was. Well, I'll let you guys get back. to it. Okay, <laughs> bye. It was good seeing you. <laughs> well, There was a lot of hesitation. There was some even my sister who was initially said that we should finally discuss about it. And then I said I was going to write blogs about it. The book was already written. Mm -hmm. It was, I think I sent it to my sister before I found the publisher for it. It was actually Debbie who finally said, Sean, but she had read the book. You should, you know, you should just send it to um, Sherry at uh, Touchpoint, who had published my first book, just to see mm -hmm. what she would think. You know, and had it not been for Debbie, I probably, I may not have ever, um, I may not have ever published a book. You know, well, I'm, I'm glad, I mean, I'm glad you did. And I hope it's something that you don't, you know, regret. I mean, I, I it's, I want to celebrate your book, but I definitely recognize the toll that it's taken on you too. But so you've got this book out, it's doing well. And so tell us, can, is there anything you can tell us about the potential for, um, is there any a potential for a film adaptation in this? There, yeah, a lot of people requested it when it was like on the um, publisher's marketplace. So a lot of people were reading it. There was a possibility through someone I had worked with before to make a version to do the book um, prior to publication. And um, it, it was some weird sacrifices I had to make. Mm -hmm. uh, for one thing, this person had a four picture deal and they'd already made three, they'd already made a commitment to three films that had male protagonists. So they said, we're interested in this, but we have to turn Rick into um, a female. Uh. So um, so I, the initial script I wrote of this was um, Rick was turned into Terry. And Terry was turned into, no, Rick was Rita. Terry was Tony. 
Wow. Wow. <laughs> it, it, took, it took an adjustment, but ultimately, and they, and they were right, it couldn't be done for the, the budget they were talking about, which was like, mm. the, um, like they were going to do it for like $1 million. Mm. There's some, there are conversations now with someone who was, who's talking about doing it in a $6 million budget way, but because of COVID, nobody, there, no one has, um, no one sent me a piece of paper yet. No one has crossed my palm with silver. Yes. <laughs> all right. <laughs> so it's, it's all still open and it's in God's hands. I would, I would very much like this to be made as a movie because I also have a prequel in mind and a sequel. I think these characters, you know, um, the prequel would involve how Betty, the, um, Bet the woman Betty became possessed. Mm -hmm. And I was originally going to tell it from Betty's point of view. I was going to, you know, tell it first person from Betty's point of view, which would be first time I would have told a first person story from a female perspective. Mm -hmm. Then I read this book called Come Closer by um, Sarah Grain, I think her name is, and it's about a woman becoming possessed, you know, and losing herself to the uh, demon. I'm like, ah, be too much like her book. Mm. So, the, so the sequel I'm going to tell from the viewpoint of Emil, who's a character in this book, Emil Kostic, Betty's husband and the widower. Oh, and that's a good idea. About him seeing his wife becoming possessed and what he was doing to try to save her, unsuccessfully save her, and the um, and how that twisted him ultimately. And I think you'll see that um, he'll turn out that he was not necessarily a completely reliable na narrator of his story. Mm. Oh, I like that. that. I can't wait. So when are you writing that one? Um, well, you know, the, it's set up at the end of the script. Yeah. Next movie would show why this just happens at the end of the script. And the third one will deal with Terry and Rick getting married, her sister, you know, the sister finding a boy and getting pregnant, you know, as well as Betty predicted that there would be another generation. Oh. And then they find themselves under assault in a different way. And, um, <coughs> and, and of course, they're shocked because they felt that they had dealt with, um, dealt with Betty successfully. But, you know, it is, everything wasn't quite as what they were told or thought. So, um, you know, well, it would be a lot. But well, right now I'm working on another book called Lifelike, and I want to finish that up first. Well, if there's one thing I know, it's gonna it's gonna be good. I haven't I've, I've the books that you've read and and I was able to read a screenplay that you sent me to at, oh, about a year or two ago, and I mean everything well, you write, is, you. huh? Which screenplay did I say? The I um, I John. I, I John. Yes. Yep. Yep. And now that in theory is going to be made. So that's uh, awesome. That uh, is awesome. Uh, you know, there's some changes in it that I don't necessarily like. But <laughs> I think it would have already been in production if it wasn't for COVID. Wow. Now is that is that going to be um is that a mo going to be a movie or a series? Um, a movie. There was talk of a series. Okay. Somebody, when I, when it came time to sign this option for mm -hmm. the third and final option for I John, um, somebody else was in. They were looking to make it a series. The people who have it now. But somebody else called me and said they had a deal and they wanted to make that as a series. But, you know, they they disappeared at the time I needed to make the decision, so I went with the people who currently had the um, option. Gave okay. them one more bite at the apple. <laughs> if it happens in this period, it's going to happen. If not, I'm probably going to take it. If, it, if they don't fulfill the, the terms of the option, I may, let, you know, I probably will take it off the market because I would like to do it as a book too. Oh yeah, I could see. Oh yeah, I mean, like I said, I. It's funny you say that because I I wrote a book first and then I went to screenwriting, and people are like, my originally my the, my book that I wrote was set up to be a three part series, and I just it's exhausting. It is exhausting to write a book. I love. I think I like, and I because I have so many ideas. I think I like that writing a screenplay. Um, there's a quicker payoff there. I mean, regardless if it gets made or not, you know. But it's like, it's you know, you're. I don't know. There's just it's just such a. It took it out of me. Writing a book is just such a different animal, and you know, there's it's just a different writing technique. I mean, you know, you have to be more descriptive and. But it's, it's also easier. You think so? 
it's definitely easier to write a book because uh, it may take more time because you can get into a character's mind in a book. In a screenplay, you have to reduce everything to words and action. And, right. And with the, I mean, dialogue and action. Mm -hmm. And you can't get too direct because then you're on too on the nose. So I think it's harder to write a really good screenplay than it is to write, you know, to write a book because you have more tools at your disposal with a book. And also, two things, um, I think, a, you know, a book gives you, you have the freedom in a book. Now, I've been very lucky that the, on my first book, the editor only only had me cut out. My initial editor, a friend of mine, Trish, had me cut 100 pages out of that first book. Oh, wow. Like, there was a lot of stuff she just didn't feel was forwarding the story. Like, mm -hmm. This would be a nice little short piece, but it doesn't belong in the book. Mm -hmm. By the time it got to the publisher, the editor hired by the publisher, they only had a couple paragraphs cut out. Now, on, um, they cut nothing out of Chapel Street, nothing big. They made a lot of little changes to the editor. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't remember from when, when I read it before it was published to now. I, I don't remember anything different. Punctuations, mm -hmm. you know, breaking some sentences into two, things sure. like, like that. But the thing is, I was talking to my editor from, from, from the publisher, and she said she hates first-person books. And when she saw that mine was first book, she looked at it with dread. And she <laughs> said she often... When she's assigned to do people who have books in the first person, she makes them rewrite the entire book from the third person. Really? Yeah. So um, I liked. I loved that. I like. I like the first person. Um, you know, I mean, both of them are okay, but the, I don't know if it's just the way you write or not. But I, I, I like that you wrote it from the first person. That. I don't know. Like you said, I think you get into their mind more. You, I, I don't know if maybe you're, there's more of a connection with that with the protagonist. I don't know what it is, but it, it really, this book really hooks you and, and you get drawn right into it from the get. I mean, there's really no, um, you know, it's not lagging. It's not a slow start. Um, you know, you just feel compelled to read it right off the bat. Well, thank you. I tell you, it'll be interesting to tell the story from Emil's point of view because he's a different kind of guy. Than so I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to the challenge of that. But also, here's another thing about um, having a book. If you have a book and it gets out and it gets critically reviewed or it becomes a bestseller or something, when you make a movie of it, people are going to be much more hesitant to make stupid changes. You know, because <laughs> That's they true. To the people. So to me, I kind of would rather have a book out first mm -hmm. and, market, and market a script. In this case... With um, Chapel Street, I have a script. And, you know, although the book is um, first person, there isn't a single one. I tell it from the third person. It's still point of view Rick. You know, he's in every scene of the, of the book. Right. It's the flashbacks where somebody's telling him something or flashbacking what that person saw. Mm -hmm. Other than that, it's all Rick's point of view. But there is no voiceover. I tell it strictly word and action. Yep. I, don't, I don't cheat and go to voiceover. Even though the entire book, the entire mm -hmm. novel, is essentially voiceover. <laughs> uh, the, the screenplay, you know, it was a mm -hmm. challenge. And I tell you what, I was writing the screenplay before the novel was finished, the final finish. And there were some things I liked, I thought were better told in, through action in the novel. I mean, in the screenplay. And I, I ricocheted those changes back to the book itself. Mm. So I was working early on the idea. To me, you know, when I wrote my first book... Uh, promise my memoir i had no anticipation nor desire for it to become a movie zero desire i can see why. i can see book, why but when i wrote this book it's like yes i would like this to be a movie man. i movie. wanted it to be <laughs> <laughs> well between the two of us maybe we could make it happen <laughs> i have no doubt it'll be successful i have no doubt i know i, I know it'll get picked up this is the kind of film that people like to see too yes you know, fans of the genre will really like this. And that's what I'm really happiest about the reception the book is getting. Actually, the only negative internet review, other, well, there's one minor one. The only, like, person who really read the book and really disliked it was a Christian reviewer. You know, and I think I went too far for him. You know. Who was, who, who was it? What did you say? Well, I don't want to give the guy's name, but there was, it's a Christian website. And oh, okay. they read the book and they gave it. An absolutely scathing review. What? Yeah. They, You'll they, have to tell me off the record. <laughs> yeah. 
get out of That's that. off. I, I cannot face, even. I can't even. I think he was less reviewing the book than he was angry that someone who is in the faith field was writing something that was that was pretty um, lurid. And, you know, there's not like any graphic sex in the book, but the no. issue of sexuality comes up in it. You know, yeah. You know, and. Yeah. Oh my gosh, you oh. dealt with reality, Sean. How dare you deal with reality? No way. You mean you didn't go to the altar and a tear rolled down your eye and you accepted Christ and Betty was gone? Are you serious? Yeah, yeah and <laughs> I love Christian movies because the protagonist never really did anything wrong. You know what I mean? Yeah. They have like some minor complaint, you know, their football right. team's losing. <laughs> right. you know, everything's going fine except their football team's losing. So they accept Jesus and the football team. <laughs> right. But they, you know, their behavior, they were, if you look at it, the way these characters in Christian films, and my own too, not my, not my own fault, but that's the way they are. The characters are essentially already talking and acting like Christians. Right, you know, they exactly. Just haven't, they haven't formalized the contract yet by going <laughs> down the altar publicly. <laughs> you know, so uh, I was trying to make this book, you know, much more realistic based on my own experiences and um, what sure. I've seen family and all. So it's, you know, I'm, you know, it's not a G-rated book. No, it's not. If, but if but is, is, life, <laughs> is life G-rated? Is the Bible G-rated? The Bible certainly isn't G-rated. That's not even R. That's like sometimes it's NC-17, the, some of the graphic stuff in there. You know, that's that's just the reality. And God knows that. That's why he, he put real life in there for real life people. <laughs> yeah. well, that's, you know, this is my constant complaint. Because I'm in all these message boards, all these uh, Facebook groups and this and that for faith-based films. And it's always the whole thing. It's like, you know, can we have, you know, you know, people always saying you can't have an R-rated Christian film like Passion to Christ. Uh, exactly. <laughs> Un unplanned. And it's sort of like, and there's a lot of people in the faith market, and maybe this guy's the same way, that simply felt and cannot, that horror is inherently non-Christian, which is absurd too. That is very absurd. Particularly, I think there's quite a few demons devils and in the Bible. Right, and, exactly. But you'll hear these people in these groups. I mean, think about the same. They're of, saying you just simply cannot do these things. It's wrong. <laughs> I mean, think about if they had written the part where the pe that was it the Sadducees, they, they saw what Jesus did casting out the demons. So they went to go do the same thing, but the demons essentially beat the tar out of them, stripped them naked, and sent them out into the streets. I'm sorry, that's not G-rated. Like, you know, that's a horror. That's a horror chapter. <laughs> yeah, I tell you what, there was a, uh, and I forgot the passage now, but it was in Ezekiel. It was very, a very NC-17 passage. And every, and anytime anyone um, would ask me what my favorite Bible verse was, I would always give them that. And uh -huh. if they looked it up, they would be shocked. So. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know, so um, it's interesting that the only, like, lengthy review that's um, negative is from a Christian source. And they were very offended by the book. You know? Wow. Well, well you know what? Yeah, but you can tell that they just hate it. They just hate it, hate it, hate it. Well, you, and, you're going to um, always have a critic. I'm I'm definitely consider myself a, you know, a person of faith and I loved it. So, they don't get to be the the know-all, tell-all, you know, the authority on that. So, I I definitely recommend this book Chapel Street. It is an amazing it is a great read for a cold night for sure. Well, thank you, Jane. Well, we will talk to you. Um, I, I really appreciate you coming on, and I'm sure I will have you on again. I always enjoy talking to you. It's always a great conversation. So I appreciate you coming on my show, and hopefully we'll talk to you soon. Well, I'm glad to be here on the show with you because I do talk to you off the show, at least this way. Other people get to join in. Yeah, they get to hear our conversation. <laughs> <laughs> and my wife often joins in on our conversation. Yeah, I, I always enjoy when so, she does. <laughs> you know, so here we are. You're, you're one of these people you get to meet in the, in the movie, in the writing world, you know. And it's, yes. It's always good to talk to a peer, you know, and talk well, about Well, I'm not a peer. I consider you my mentor, so I, I wouldn't call Anybody, you know, somebody once told me I was at a Christian film festival. And somebody, I couldn't believe they actually said this, you know, they're, they're amongst the, the other writers. Well, you know, they're not our peers. And I'm like, what are you talking about? 
<laughs> and, um, because we have more movies made, before we had movies made, we were still the same writers we are now. <laughs> you, know? you know, whether or not we have movies made doesn't make people peers. You know, it's like, are they writing? Are they writing well? You know, I believe talent will out, you know, as long as you don't give up and as long as you keep marketing. So sure. I have a lot of confidence in you, and uh, so we are Thank we you. are definitely peers. Well, I appreciate that. I take that as a huge compliment, but I will forever refer to you as my mentor. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Sean Paul Murphy, and I look forward to seeing what happens with this soon. We'll talk to you soon. Okay. Thank you very much. Robert. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Still recording.